Hi there and welcome back to another little session of learning some things from the Word of God. This, today's message will be entitled, Why Did Jesus Exist? He still exists today in heaven, but why did Jesus exist in the year zero through, let's say, 33 and a half AD? What was his purpose? Was it just to come and become a baby and be born and walk the earth and do good, as some people think? Was it to become the savior of the world and die on a cross to forgive um, people for their sins, to usher them into heaven? Was he here for other reasons than that? Was he here to instruct us to do certain things? Was he here to give us any kind of favor or gifts or any, anything? Well, why don't we find out through God's Word today uh, exactly why Jesus did come to this earth, and then you can take it for what it's worth, what the Bible says, or you can reject it. See, life is full of choices. That's the beautiful thing that God gives us, the choice to accept what He says in His Word or to reject it. So, I've actually accepted every word that's in this Bible because it's an owner's manual for life and I can't wait to share a few things with you in a few minutes because God really uh, is good and, and He did send Jesus to accomplish uh, more than you might even imagine. So let's get on with it. We'll start with the book of Isaiah. Now Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1 says uh, this. I, in fact, I should read it. It's a prediction. Now, when Isaiah says, the Lord's God's Spirit is upon me, he's not talking about him in the now. What he's talking about is he's prophesying about a person who will come in the future. That's what prophecy is all about. That's what prophets did. God would give them a word from himself that is before the New Testament was written. After that, you will notice there are no more prophets because all is fulfilled when Jesus came and um, instructed his guys, if you will, to finish the Bible, finish the New Testament. But before that, and in the Old Testament, known as the Hebrew book, if you will, of the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, who existed on the planet around 750 B.C., he had this to say, and he was predicting again, he was predicting, projecting out in the future that somebody would come and say this, the Lord God's Spirit is upon me because the Lord God has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim claim a release for all those who are in captivity and liberation for prisoners and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, that means nothing to you, so I will have to explain that uh, and the best way I know how to do it is with the Bible. Always explain the Bible and prove the Bible with the Bible is what I say. So what is he talking about? He sent me to bring good news to the poor. What is he talking about, Isaiah, the prophet, saying that someday somebody will come to bring good news to the poor and to heal and bind the brokenhearted, those who have no hope? And what does he mean when he is here to proclaim a release of captives? What, is everybody like held in captivity? No. Um, when this Messiah, if you will, this deliverer, would come some time in the future, like 750 years from the time Isaiah pro projected this, to ha that would it, it would happen, when this Messiah, this Deliverer would come, he would do all of these things and he would also set the prisoners free and he would announce this is the year of God's delivering a favor to mankind, a good thing, some good stuff if you will. So, that uh, was spoken about, as I say, in 750 B.C. Now, let's fast forward our clock to the year 30 A.D. This is when Jesus was beginning his ministry. 
He went out to the desert, was tempted by Satan. Um, he quoted uh, chapters and verses uh, of the Bible to Satan. In other words, he said, get lost, Satan, because I'm not even paying any attention to you. Um, and all Satan wanted him to do was do anything that Satan commanded him. Turn the bread into stones and uh, this will happen. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 and he would quote him Bible verses. The reason uh, Satan tried to get Jesus to do anything, like had he succeeded in getting Jesus to turn uh, stones into bread because Jesus was hungry, he was out in the wilderness for about 40 days, and of course you'd be hungry, so would I. But had Jesus listened to anything that Satan said, and if he did anything, that would make Jesus subservient to Satan. That was Satan's goal. Well, that failed. So now Jesus begins his ministry after he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, not to be baptized because he was a sinner. He wasn't. It was a symbol, as I pointed out in some of my other messages, where he was going to show standing up his death, which would be on the cross, his burial, going under the water, and his resurrection, coming out of the water. That's why Jesus did it. He did it as a symbol. He did it as something that we're supposed to do to baptism by immersion in water, not sprinkling, not pouring. Always in the New Testament, people were baptized. Uh, usually in the River Jordan. Okay, but let me move off because that's another subject for another day. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 24, we get this scenario. When Jesus first began his ministry, it was customary uh, for him to go into the temple on Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, and he would uh, read from the scriptures, the Old Testament, if you will, scrolls. Um, and when he went into the temple on this one particular day, when he was beginning his ministry, the rabbi brought him the book of Isaiah. And Jesus, I mean, the, this like, I mean, Isaiah 61, so there's like a whole bunch of chapters uh, and verses of the book of Isaiah. So it's sort of like this. Jesus would pick up the book, and he'd spin through all the pages, and he would come to that chapter and that verse and Jesus according to uh, Luke 4:16, uh, it says that when he opened up the book he read this and I'll read it just like he was reading it the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year when God, the Lord God said, I am going to bestow my favor upon really the world by doing something, by giving you this anointed one that Isaiah spoke of. Then Jesus, it says in Luke 4, he closed the book up, gave it back to the minister or rabbi, if you will, of the synagogue, and he went and sat down, and the Bible says in Luke 4 that all the eyes were focused on Jesus, and he said this, he said, this day the scripture of Isaiah is fulfilled. In other words, he was saying, I am this anointed one, I am the one that Isaiah spoke of, I am he that has come to this world for many purposes, some of which include to preach the gospel to the poor, and then he would start out that way along with his disciples, and he did that and established churches and so forth and so on. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, that is, those that had no hope, no hope of heaven, no hope. They were brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives, well, who was captive? They were all living in sin. And that was punishable by um, the justice of God, which would be to commit them and condemn them into this place called the lake of fire. But Jesus was here to say, no, I've come to bring a way out of that. I have come to deliver those 
that are held in the captivity of their own sin and to set at liberty those that are bruised meaning I'm going to set uh, the prisoners like Isaiah said free prisoners of what prisoners of sin how am I going to set them free well later on in the Bible Jesus says when you know him to know the Son of Man you have known the one that can set you when you know Jesus you are free indeed and he's absolutely right he gives us the freedom to be um, to have peace and joy and happiness and all kinds of good stuff and not the stress of having the law of Moses hanging over you all the time by saying I know I'm a sinner I know I'm bad I know I'm condemned into this place called the lake of fire I'm hoping that you know I'll be good and I'll be good enough that I can get into heaven None of that works, but let me continue. So once he said that, everybody that was looking at Jesus said, they began to actually mock him in his own town of Nazareth in the uh, synagogue. They said, whoa, wait a minute. You're saying that you're the one that Isaiah is speaking of? We know who you are. You're Jesus. You're 30 years old, but we've known you since you were a little kid. We, we knew you when you were operating uh, as an assistant carpenter in your father Joseph's carpenter shop. We've seen you grow up and now you're saying you're the one that God has anointed? And then they began to mock him by saying, this is all in Luke chapter 4, 16 through 24. They began to mock him by saying, well, we hear that you're out there doing signs and wonders and miracles. And why don't you show us some of that, your tricks? that you do out there in Capernaum and so forth, why don't you show us those tricks right here in Nazareth? Well, Jesus said to them, you know what? I mean, he was on to their game of disbelief. So he said, you know what? You Surely one day you that are sitting here in the synagogue are going to say to me, physician, in other words, I'm a healer, you're not going to see it, but they have in Capernaum and elsewhere, and they'll see it in my ministry. You won't, but you're going to say to me one day, Healer, physician, heal thyself. And one day on a cross in the future, three and a half years from then, that's exactly the, what they were saying. They were mocking him again, saying, Come on down from the cross, heal yourself. Come on, you can do it. You think you're the king of the Jews? You're the great physician? Come on down. So what he predicted actually came true, of course, and it would. And he also said this, he said, I say this to you, I'm here under God's authority, my Father which is in heaven, and I have done signs and wonders, but I cannot do anything here in Nazareth because of your unbelief. And I'm thinking, you know what, that's about the same thing that happens uh, today. People read this book, it's a historical book. If it was bunk, they would have thrown this Bible out a long time ago and said, it's bunk. But nobody can prove that Jesus did not come to the earth. Nobody can prove that he was not born in Bethlehem, because history says he was. Nobody can prove that he roamed around in the, in the area of Galilee and Capernaum in Israel. Nobody can prove that he didn't say and preach in the synagogues all that he said that he did and said that he did in this book, New Testament. Uh, nobody can prove that. Nobody can prove that he did not go to the cross and die, uh, was crucified there. Nobody can prove, uh, they've certainly tried to, the people in the synagogue tried to say, to get p uh, the guards that were guarding the tomb after Jesus went to the cross and then was missing from his tomb, resurrected, they said to the guards, look at before, just tell everybody that his apostles came and stole the body, and we'll pay you to say this. Uh, so that's, I mean, we can't have them believing that the one we crucified somehow was resurrected, even though he said he would be. So that's how they always tried to disprove it. But if that were true, it didn't hold up. It didn't hold up because of this. 500 people within the city 
of Jerusalem after Jesus was raised from the dead on that Sunday, April 13, 33 AD, he, um, 500 people saw him. Mary Magdalene saw him and reported it back to the other disciples and the apostles. And uh, two on the road to Emmaus, which I've said before, recorded that uh, one guy's name was Cleopas, Cleopas, and the other guy is yet unnamed in the Bible, but they were witnesses that they walked to, on the road to Emmaus with Jesus, they saw him, they spoke with him, and then they recognized him. This was after he was resurrected. All of his apostles, now 11 of them because Judas was dead, went out and hung himself, but all the apostles saw Jesus, ate with Jesus, uh, worshipped with Jesus, spent 40 days with Jesus, and then he ascended into heaven. Now, if it were not true, why would the apostles go and write the New Testament? Why would they take the threats to be uh, put on the cross themselves like Peter was, or beheaded like some of them were? Why would they take that risk if Jesus, if they really knew Jesus was dead and they smuggled his body out of the tomb, um, why would they say that? And why would they preach the gospel uh, powerful? Why would they preach about this one called Jesus? They wouldn't. So there's 500 plus three, the two on the road to Emmaus plus Mary Magdalene, plus the apostles, 515 people saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And he also said that all of this has happened through his writers of the New Testament. God the Father who wrote, if you will, or inspired to have written the Old Testament said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, hear what he has to say. God stepped aside as of the New Testament and Jesus was the preeminent one. So now why else was Jesus here? He said, he came to preach the good news to the poor. That's what Isaiah said. Jesus said, I am he. I am that one. I came to preach the good news to the poor. The rich had no reason to have God in their life. They were rich. They were abundantly wealthy. They had everything that they needed. So why would they need God? They wouldn't. So he came to preach the good news, the gospel, if you will, which is another word for gospel, is good news, that there is a way to get out of this captivity of sin, there is a way to get out of this punishment for sin, the wages of sin is death, according to the Bible, and that way is through him. Well, when he was preaching this while he was on the earth, he had not gone to the cross yet to become the one uh, who would take your sins and my sins upon himself and exchange that for what we call his robe of righteousness. The only way God can see you is when you're wearing the robe of righteousness that you get from Jesus when you accept him as Lord and Savior and say, yes, I believe you are Jesus, the Son of God. I believe everything that you wrote in this Bible. I believe that you ascended back into heaven and you're sitting at the right hand of God. I believe all those things and I want you to forgive my sins and I want you to come into my life and save me. And you can find out how to do this on my link down below, by the way, here on YouTube. Uh, so if you believe all that stuff, he says, that's the good news that I bring you. That's the good news that my apostles will bring once he goes back to heaven. And that's the one that Mary out there in YouTube land and John Tyler and whoever who believed and who received me as their Lord and Savior, they're passing that on. That's the good news that you can enter into heaven. But Jesus came to this earth for another purpose other than to die on the cross, other than just to get you a ticket into heaven. And I'll explain that as well. He came to heal those who were broken hearted, meaning they have no hope. They have no hope of eternal security, none. Jesus came to bring that hope to mankind, including the Jews and the Gentiles, and uh, that's what he did. He came to pre preach or declare how those who are held in captive, captivity of sin, prisoners of sin, how they can be free from that, and free from that oppression of the law of Moses that they could not possibly keep. 
So it went on to, uh, he went on to say, by the way, in John chapter 10, verse 10, this, the thief, which is Satan, he came only to steal, meaning to steal your ability to gain heaven and to steal all the good things that I want to bring to you. He's a, he's a thief. He came to steal. He came to kill, meaning if, if Satan could get uh, you dead, if you will, if he could in any way, shape, or manner get you to die without accepting the Lord as your Savior, then he's come to kill you not just physically, but spiritually, you're going to end up in that lake of fire where he's going. So John 10.10 10 says, The thief Satan came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Destroy what? Destroy all the good things, as I say, that Jesus wants to bring to you and that God wants to bring to you, which is another part of why Jesus existed. And he says, But I, on the other hand, opposite of him, I've come to... Uh, to bring you life, that is eternal life in heaven, but I've also, my second function is to bring you life here on the earth and to bring it more abundantly. And uh, Jesus knew that people will, will be struggling to accept what he says. <clears throat> Gotta have a drink now. To accept all that he says here, and accept Him as their Lord and Savior, as the only one who can forgive your sins and give you that ticket, if you will, to get into heaven because He's the only one who died on the cross for your sins. And there's only one way to get to the Father, and that's through Jesus, according to Him in John 14, 6. Okay, so He knew that it would be very tough for people to, they either have to believe what He says, or they have to believe what Satan, the thief, and the liar, and the deceiver said since the beginning of the, uh, since the beginning of time when he coerced Eve to bite of that uh, forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden by saying, I know what God told you that you die, but I'm telling you, no, you won't. You're going to believe God, or you're going to believe me. He says the same thing today, so it's a struggle for all of us to come to that crossroads in our life where we have to decide, we have to choose, do we really want to believe what God and His Son Jesus said? Do we really want to believe that Jesus came into existence for the purpose of getting us into heaven and for giving us good stuff while we're here on this earth? Or are we going to believe what Satan says? Well, now it's all a fairy tale. Don't believe any of that stuff. God said this in John 6.40, um, Everyone who sees the Son, His Son, Jesus, who sees Him and believes in Him, will have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. And the most famous verse in the Bible probably is John 3.16. God says this through John 3.16. For God, in other words, let me talk like I was God for a minute. For I so love this world that I gave my only begotten Son, Jesus, so that whosoever out there in YouTube land believes in my Son will not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life with Him in heaven. So we have to either believe that or believe Satan's lie, that there is no God or that Jesus was just a fable and didn't exist, even though historical facts in this book prove otherwise. Okay. Um, Isaiah said this, and I can hurry this along. He also said in chapter 9, Isaiah, the old prophet from 750 B.C., said this, again, he was prophesying, For unto us, the people, a child is born, a son is given to us. Did that happen? We say yes. Jesus can. A child is born. The government will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called... Wonderful Counselor, which He is, Prince of Peace, which He is, Mighty God, which He is, Everlasting Father, which He is, and His government, this is Isaiah saying, His, Jesus' government, and He will have a government. Remember, maybe you don't know, but the word anointed one or Messiah means, and, the, and my Jewish friends expected this, a Messiah would be the anointed or appointed one 
that would come and be the king and would rule over them and uh, over the people on the earth. He would bring peace to the earth. Um, so Isaiah says his government, Jesus' government, will be, will hit his peace with that government that he brings to the earth will never end. Remember you heard it said and it's on half a dozen Christmas cards out there, I guess. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We have not seen peace on earth, have we? I, I haven't. I've been around a long time. But Jesus promises that there will be peace on earth when he comes back. And I've already said this in other messages. He's going to come back soon once that temple on Mount Zion is built. He's going to come back, take his saints out of here for three and a half years. All hell breaks loose on the earth. Then he returns, sets foot on Mount Zion inhabits that temple in Jerusalem, then he puts Satan in hell for 1,000 years and he rules the earth and without Satan on the earth, imagine the peace that we have. That's what he brings. Then after that, it's forever peace uh, because Jesus is in control. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David, Isaiah said. This is exactly what will be happening. He will rule from the throne of David for all eternity, which is exactly what will be happening. And the, the, uh, he goes on to say that a child would be born, and it says uh, that this Messiah would come and be born in the little town of Bethlehem. That was 750 years ago. So let me say that... Uh, the prophet Micah, who also existed in 750 B.C., you can look it up in your Bible, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, he's speaking of the future, he says, but you, Bethlehem, even though you be little among all the towns and cities of the, of the area known as Judah, yet out of you shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of all Israel, whose goings forth have been predicted from old, from everlasting. So Micah's predicting that the babe would be born, as did Isaiah, that he would come out of the town of Bethlehem. Strange. So that's why it's kind of difficult for me to believe that even all of the historical information that's found in this Bible and across history, history books itself, uh, stating that all of these things will come to pass, the Bethlehem, the child will be born, an anointed one, um, prophecy after prophecy was fulfilled, and yet today people still don't believe. So, again, like I first started out, it's all about choices. You choose to say, okay, I believe, or I don't believe. <clears throat> now, one of the other things that Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16 through 20 is this, he said, let your light, your light, if you're a Christian, yet your light, Jesus first said about himself, he said, I am the light of the world. Then he went to heaven, now he says to us, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and they will, uh, your good works will shed light on the Father which is in heaven, basically. And, uh, <clears throat> What he says later on in the Bible, he says, uh, people that don't do that, Christians that don't do that, they're kind of like floating around in the, in the world, and he's not really going to bless them at all. Um, and what he says is, it, you know, if they deny, he says, basically, if you're ashamed of his name, in other words, you're, nobody can tell that you're a Christian, your family doesn't know, your co-workers have no clue because you live like the rest of the world out there, then what he's saying is that, it, well, what he did say was, if you deny me before men, in other words, if you're not letting your light shine to other men, if you're not telling other people about me, if you're kind of hiding me like, uh, you know, I'm that lost relative that nobody wants to speak about, he says, if you're ashamed of me, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. So that's pretty heavy uh, things for him to say. But let's get back to why he's, why he's here. He also said, um, I did not come to condemn anybody using the law. 
But he does say this. He says, I say unto you, heaven and earth shall pass away, which is true. This heaven, the first heaven here, our atmosphere, and the earth will burn with her fervent heat. But what he says is, heaven and earth will pass away, but nothing from the law, that is the Ten Commandments, the laws of Moses, nothing will pass from the law till all be fulfilled. What he means by that is, at some point, everybody gets called up before God the Father, <clears throat> and he then ascertains whether or not you accepted his son. If not, he's going to judge you by the law. That's why Jesus says the law is not going to be uh, finished until all is, is uh, fulfilled. And all is fulfilled at that great white throne judgment. And then people who are judged under the law, unfortunately, get cast into that lake of fire, which I've said so many times before. Now, let me get to back to another thing that Jesus says why he was here, is he wants to give us the very best. While we're here, he says, I want to bring you life in heaven eternally and life more abundantly on the earth. And the best way I can say that is to give you the illustration of, as soon as I find my notes here, um, that we're like, um, we drift around through life like the story of the caterpillar. Well, a caterpillar, what's that? It's an ugly looking, creepy, crawly thing who crawls around on the ground and when he comes to a pebble, he's got to go around it or slink over it. But it takes him a long while to get past that obstacle. If he comes to a puddle, he's not going through it, so he's got to creep and crawl all the way around the obstacle to get to his goal, to get to his destination. And I kind of liken that to finally when that caterpillar does get to his destination, it's sort of like if we accept the Lord as Savior, that caterpillar, we become like him. We get wrapped up in this cocoon, something that protects us and uh, keeps us, which is God's Word. And then we turn into this butterfly, a beautiful creature that emerges out of this uh, caterpillar stage and then we can fly over and look down on those obstacles that used to be in our way. You don't have anything in your way anymore. Once you accept the Lord as your Savior, He's there to guide you, to protect you, and to bring you uh, good stuff. So I think that is where we're going to end up this message at, although I have to give you one final story about lepers. If you knew uh, what leprosy was, it's kind of a spooky disease, but back in the day when Jesus was here, people that had leprosy would be, their, their hands and their feet and their digits and their ears, their skin would begin to actually rot. That's what leprosy was. And eventually their digits, fingers, whatever, earlobes, stuff, nose would fall off. And eventually this leprosy would eat them from within and they would die from this leprosy disease. But what they had to do is they would, uh, when they approached anybody within 15 or 20 feet, I suppose, the Bible says that they had to raise their hands in the air saying, I am unclean, I'm a leper, I'm unclean. In other words, stay away from me, I'm unclean. And that reminds me too of how, why Jesus came to the earth, because all of us are like the lepers, we're unclean. We need to be cleansed of that sin and that decay that's going to eventually kill us eternally and set us into that lake of fire. And Jesus came to free us from that and to cleanse us from that. And um, the story goes on to say in Matthew 4, 23, 4 and 5, that Jesus uh, came down out of the mountain uh, from Galilee and he was teaching in the synagogues and so forth. And he came upon this leper who said to him, I, uh, the leper came up to Jesus and worshipped him saying, Lord, if you want to, you can cleanse me. So he had complete faith and belief in this one called Jesus, the great physician, the great healer. <coughs> Here we go. 
enough faith to believe that he could be cleansed from all of his leprosy. And you don't touch lepers, but yet Jesus reached out his hands to this leper and he came to him and he touched him and he said, because of your faith, uh, you are healed and I will heal you. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed and the leper went off. Later on, 10 lepers came before Jesus because they found out he already healed one uh, leper and they didn't want to be lepers. So he healed all 10 and all 10 left, only one thanked him. And he said, where are the other nine? They never thanked him for that. And so if you are a Christian today and you have all the benefits that Jesus uh, wants to give you and has given you, and he, including protection from his angels and so forth, every now and then, like daily, I go and thank him for that. And when I said earlier, um, I was thrilled because uh, when you finally ask the Lord to show you his plan and purpose for your life, he does that. And with that, and with that fellowship that you develop with God through his son, Jesus, he brings you good stuff. And this week, um, even today alone, it's just amazing to me, all the good stuff that seems to come uh, my way. I, I don't ask for it, although I kind of did. I, uh, the guy that loans me the CDs for when I sing, it's like $30,000 worth of CDs. And he loans them to me for free. Well, he is in the mood to sell those things. So what he said to me was, John, I'm going to give you basically a gift. Give me $300 and you can have all $30,000 worth of CDs. Because he's moving on to better and brighter things, I guess. Well, I could certainly use those. So um, I then told the Lord what my situation was. And I'm telling you, it wasn't even five minutes after that phone call. I said, I'll take them. And I'll just, and I wanted to take it easy on myself and stay within my budget. So I said, uh, I'll buy them if you take a hundred bucks this month, a hundred in November and a hundred in December. Well, it makes it easier on me. But the phone rang five minutes after that and a guy uh, that was gonna buy a house months ago didn't do it because the price was still up there, but the price got dropped today by 15,000. So he called me up and he said, I wanna buy that house. He signed the offer. I've submitted the offer along with his pre-approval letter, got his check. So when that closes, that will give me about 3,200 extra dollars that I wasn't counting on. Winter's coming, you know, buys oil for the house at a thousand bucks a tank and it pays for those CDs. So that's what I'm talking about. God is always there uh, to deliver me uh, and to deliver and take care of me and take care of the needs that come around on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd say 10 minutes after that, a lawyer called up and he said that one of your builders wanted to buy three lots from us. Well, we're ready to go on that. So I said, okay, let's do it. So, I mean, there's three more potential land deals there. So it looks like my winter will turn out to be pretty good. That's my point. So Isaiah said of old, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength like uh, they had the wings like an eagle. Again, like the butterfly, it can soar above all these obstacles. So we have two choices here. First choice is, do we want to get into heaven? If we do, you have to click on the link, if you will, a salvation link, and know who this Jesus is. And then the second thing is you've got to believe and have faith that he'll also do all the promises that he said he would in this Bible. He'll take care of your daily bread needs, which he has demonstrated to me time in and time out that he will do. So that's where I'll leave you and I'll see you next week. Now you know the reason Jesus is on the earth and it came into existence was for your benefit, entirely for your benefit, because God loves you. I'll see you next week.